My name is Joanne Gill from DD um, and today I'm joined by digital dentistry pioneer Professor Adam Nolte who's from Dentist on the Rock in Bury. Today we're going to be talking about how dentists have used digital dentistry to support the NHS through COVID-19 and what preparations are underway to help us return to some kind of new normal. We'll be taking questions at the end of the live stream so if you have any questions you'd like to ask please feel free to type them in or we can go live to you at the end. This really is about starting a conversation, so please ask. So let's get started. Adam, why don't you start by telling us about you and your experience? Uh, so me personally, before the COVID, uh, before all this, before the beard. Um, so basically, um, I was lucky enough to start my own uh, clinic or back maybe six years ago now. Uh, I worked in the NHS for 10 years and uh, along that time, I was doing courses here, there and everywhere on different things. Um, I started to do uh, implants in about 2011. Um, and really, as I was working in, it was a, a big NHS um, set of practices. I was doing maybe eight and a half thousand UDAs and my private side was building up at the same time. Uh, and as I was doing that, I kind of got to the point where I couldn't really focus on the things that I like doing. So the, the digital side, the, um, you know, the implants or the cosmetic side, at the same time as working in the NHS with that volume of units. So uh, I made the decision to set my own place up, um, like I said, six years ago. Uh, at the same time, I, I was finishing the masters, setting up things and um, with the IDDA, that sort of thing. And then um, I started my PhD about 2014, 15. Uh, but at the same time as starting up the practice, uh, probably not the best of ideas to run on the same time, but um, that's cracked on and coming to the end of things uh, next year. Um, but that's based on guided surgery and uh, dentalist guided surgery to be specific. Um, at the same time, the digital side of things has grown and I kind of got into things with digital probably backwards to what we find uh, most people doing um, because with with the students that we've had with the DDA and things, uh, everybody kind of goes in scanner first and builds from there. Um, I didn't have a scanner. I, I started off with, you know, mesh mixer and digital things and 3D printing uh, going back, you know, eight years ago or so. And um, really getting into the CEREC at the start of things uh, with the, um, the Omnicam. And then we went into my new practice, uh, took things further by setting up everything I wanted in there. And as we've expanded, so is the digital, uh, so that every room has a scanner, uh, every, um, we've got a couple of other machines, too many 3D printers, uh, all sorts of um, gadgets, you know, here, there and everywhere to help streamline things. Um, we set it up from the get-go as, as completely paperless. And um, it kind of, it, it really was, me doing the things that I wanted really. And um, it went from there. So with, with 3D printing, that was probably more of a, an addiction that I probably shouldn't have got into. <laughs> um, I've had maybe eight or nine 3D printers over the years and, okay. and, and yeah, probably went in things a little bit backwards with that. Um, I don't, so I don't it for a purpose. I think that's probably quite a good lead in to what what have you been doing while the practices have been closed and what have you been doing to help the NHS? Uh, probably too much, to be honest with you. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my wife's been driven mad with uh, with stuff. I brought I brought all my gadgets home. Um, I'm, you know, I've got a, a good size house, so I was lucky. I've got a portion which is like a granny annex, uh, okay. and um, in that section, I've got a scanner. I've got five 3D printers um, and they're all for me to prototype things. Uh, we started off really with the, the DDA group, which uh, was me, Chris, Patrick and, and Quintus that we've been building up over the last um, four years now. And we went international a few years ago and um, mm -hmm. it really got to the point where at the start of the pandemic, we had maybe 13 and a half, 14,000 people um, on the Facebook group couple of thousand on the website as members uh, and yeah. so all of these all of these people have all connections to digital with companies with um with having equipment themselves and so i had the idea that you know it was it was actually with matt hancock's call to arms sort of thing where he 
Uh, it basically said if anybody can help the NHS with, with things for the front line, uh, mm -hmm. put your caps on. So um, my idea was that, you know, we can, what better way for, um, you know, a horde of dentists, technicians, and uh, everybody who has all this digital equipment to be able to put the minds together, produce things. Uh, mm -hmm. and, um, and it kind of went from there, really. So it built up, we built this, uh, the 3D printer um, COVID-19 initiative. Um, I think it's that you can still go on the website and do stuff, although we've not really been doing things the last couple of weeks. Okay. Uh, we print COVID19.com. Uh, and all of that, really, we had some great help with a, a load of different people, um, you know, Dan Schaffer and people like that, that were just really getting involved. Uh, but it was just a, a, an amazing um, push forward from March where there was people helping literally all over the world with different things. People like mm -hmm. Dental Directory who were um, sending out resins of, you know, like 10,000 pounds with the resins that we shipped out to a few places. Um, we, we prototyped and built a few different things like ventilator parts, um, mass designs, uh, things for thermoformers, um, visors, uh, a lot of the little things really that um, me here in my place was really me designing things and, in 3D and mesh mixer. And then once that would be designed, it would go off. Um, it kind of came to an end when the demand for it went down going back about two, three weeks ago, four weeks maybe, um, started to tail off, uh, thankfully. Um, and then um, went from there. But we, we got in touch with so many different people. It was, do you know what? Uh, regardless of all the, the last couple of weeks of, of politics with, with things, we're getting back to work, which has been um, a nightmare. The, um, the, the nice thing is that with the PP side of things, uh, I've never seen dentists and technicians come together the way that they had done. It was a really beautiful and positive experience for, for us. So, you know, it was a really good thing. Do you have any idea about actually what you've managed to deliver into the NHS? So have you got yeah. some numbers? Definitely, yeah. So we, we raised in total um, about 7,500. Um, it was, unlike a couple of people, we weren't doing anything for profit. There was zero profit made for it. Uh, mm. we, we, we did end up with an excess that I'll talk about in a sec, but we, we raised about 7,500. There were some people who were just volunteering completely with everything, with time and parts and what have you. Uh, mm -hmm. We produced in the end close to 15,000 visors um, across wow. um, not just the UK, but a little bit in a couple of other places. Uh, but it was, you know, we, we ended up with teaming up with a couple of different people to come up with ideas of getting older masks and stuff like that. Um, the, prob the biggest problem that in a way, gladly only came at the end was, was the MHRA side of things. They, came, they, they were very um, cagey about involving 3D printing. So with the, the now we've got this lull really in demand that we're trying to um, get the MHRA uh, side of things for anything that we've been designed so that it can be used for, um, you know, in for the future. things to go forward again with another second wave, hopefully not. But if it did, then, you know, we'd have everything be able to use straight off. We actually got there with, um, with the visors, uh, a mass type, uh, but, um, but nothing else. So okay. yeah, it's, um, it ended up, you know, producing a lot of different things. We, and the last thing I was going to say was we ended up with about two and a half thousand now um, from an excess of uh, the funds that we raised that went towards Bridge to Aid. Leo's trying to ring me and turn that up. Um, Bridge to Aid and also uh, the Loving Bike Giving Charity, which both of which uh, do different things for, uh, for charity for Africa. And, you know, to, to raise that alone was, was great. So it sounds like you've certainly been busy um, yeah. and also with some really good results. Uh, so dentists have been told that they can open again from next Monday. So is that something you're planning to do in practice and what preparations have you been making? Well, for me personally, I'm, I was, because I'm a fully private practice, uh, after uh, the independent practice owners group and JFH, they worked on uh, the CQC um, uh, pressure, basically, to get them to admit that we shouldn't have been closed in the first place. They shouldn't have yeah. said no. Uh, so a lot of practices uh, were open from this Monday just past. Um, I myself started to see people that was from Monday, but then 
um, the, the wonderful people behind uh, the working group uh, and the FGDP document has kind of thrown a, a little bit of a spanner in the works in, in my eyes with uh, we'd been able to open in full on, on the 8th, but um, we'll see. We'll see. It's not, it's not the only egg in the basket. And um, I think the, the, the overall result is that uh, we can, you know, the good side of things, whether you're NHS or Pride, the 8th uh, is definitely a date we can look to to start moving forward. The problem yeah. I've personally had is for, for where before we have a volume of masks, the FFP2, FFP3 masks that we had, uh, we, um, the, those, that stock of items need fit testing. So we kind of, we started to open up with dealing with non-AGPs uh, on Monday. Um, okay. A great deal. That's of, aerosol generating procedures. Yeah. So that's been a great deal of demand for people who want to come in um, but we didn't have loads of emergencies anyway, thankfully, but there, is, there hasn't been a great deal of demand for people who want to come in when those AGPs can't be provided. We can't provide those AGPs without mm -hmm. the masks. So we've just got our delivery of some masks yesterday, um, and then we've got our fit testing booked early next week. So as soon as we've got that, then um, we should be able to open in full. And, and then it's just about um, risk mitigation and all that to reduce fallow time and make it successful, which is my practice, me and my practice manager are planning at the minute. Okay. So, I mean, you, you are a digital dentistry pioneer. Um, how do you see digital dentistry sort of playing? Um, how is it going to help in a post COVID world improve patient and staff safety for you? What sort of benefits will people have from using digital dentistry? I think with, um, with digital dentistry, with moving forward uh, with treatment in, in, in clinic, the, the way that everybody is now, um, more than ever before, we need to be aware of you know, everything that we do as, as, as risk, again, thanks to uh, some things that have come out. But the, um, the, the fact is that single visit dentistry uh, or digital dentistry in general is really on the forefront of being able to provide quick and streamlined processes to make uh, treatment in practice uh, easier, safer, more predictable. It's not there to replace um, known, you know, understanding and, you know, knowledge that we're taught as, a, you know, the analog way of thinking. It's just dentistry, just done with a different tool. So if we have, you know, scanners, uh, milling machines that we can provide, you know, a single visit for a patient. Mm. If we've got an AGP procedure, then there's less risk for that patient because they're coming into the practice less. There's less risk for the, for the, um, the clinician, everything, obviously everything would need to be, you know, properly risk assessed with, you know, wiping things down and what have you. But if you could, um, if you can provide a patient, uh, an appointment and give you a good example of this. So, because we've got a couple of different scanners in the practice. We've got a couple of trios, we've got a couple of Omnicam, we've got a care stream. Um, all of those we design on, on InLab and Exacad. So both of those different softwares are open. Uh, and then we mill out on an MCXL. Now, the, when we're doing that, if we normally forget the COVID side of things, uh, we'd scan, design, and mill out, and I'd usually book for a crown anywhere between an hour and a half, two hours uh, for everything. So with the COVID side of things now, we've got an hour where we have to um, have a, a fellow time. So yeah. that gives me that time. And if I've got other mechanisms of reducing the, that fellow time with whatever you decide is right for your practice with window opening and whether that even exists, I don't know, but uh, all of that fun stuff, then, um, then you could have a short time. But realistically, either way, it won't impact your care if that patient can be provided a restoration by booking the patient in because it's the, an hour from when you put your handpiece down. So then we've got to look at what happens after the crown seated and the, again, the risk with that. But if we can minimize all of those parts and reduce the risk, then mm -hmm. I think there's a good way of um, having that single visit dentistry incorporated like never before to, to really carry on almost as normal, especially in emergency scenarios, someone with a broken or fractured tooth, then yeah. they can come in and you know, we can scan that broken tooth. And the beauty of it being digital is we can, we can cut out undercuts, all that sort of thing, and provide something which 
in you know, there's current circumstances, we don't really want that patient having to come back or go to a UDC if they're going to come into a private practice, particularly quickly. They want to be, you know, we want them to be as sturdy as possible. Some people mm -hmm. have different ideas of whether we should or shouldn't be providing, you know, more permanent things. And obviously there's some ways which we couldn't if we went to, you know, if we didn't have the equipment for AGP or what have you. But if we're providing things based on patient's best interest, then for my eyes, a single visit or digital scenario for whatever you produce um, has got to be uh, ideal. And you, can, you still can incorporate technicians. We can incorporate, you know, technicians on site, you know, someone mm -hmm. into the practice for the day. Uh, I know in our practice, I do everything myself, but there are other people in the practice, other associates who use, we've got an on-site um, on lab technician who produces things for them. So, you know, it, there's different ways of doing it, but at, at the end of the day, there's different ways that we can incorporate the existing team members that we have in a really streamlined fashion. I think for, for patients, actually, be having being able to have that one visit treatment is going to be really, really reassuring because I think they will perceive more risk the more times they have to go back. So I think it makes an awful lot of sense. Um, so you've already said, I was going to ask you kind of what treatments you're going to be able to provide for patients from the 8th of June, but I think you've already explained you, you're going to be doing aerosol generating from next week once you've got the masks fitted properly. Um, your, as I say, your website, if you have a look on your website, it's full of patient reviews that say what a fantastic experience people have had when they come and see you and everybody sings your praises. Um, and it looks like a really nice environment and a sort of very um, kind of welcoming environment. How do you feel that the patient experience is going to change and what sort of things have you done in practice that are kind of overt changes that people will immediately see when they come in? And how are you going to make people feel special in this new COVID environment? So, I mean, not FGP side of things. There's not a great, uh, sorry, not an FGP, uh, non-AGP um, side of things. Yeah. Um, there's, there's not a great deal of difference in, you know, other than the wearing of masks and things. And, you know, I think people would be expected that. And, and I think quite honestly, the way things moving forward, they'll probably be happy to see people wearing, you know, PPE that's appropriate to protect them as well as protect the, the, you know, the staff and the dental practice. So mm. it's really about making things, like I said, not just like digital dentistry, but the practice experience streamlined so that it's uh, familiar, but the new normal. So, you know, things that we've done in practice is, you know, incorporate, um, you know, the um, guard a reception and that, but the reception is the same. If anything, um, we, we were already pretty, open, white, we tried to have everything looking, um, you know, very tidy, um, clean, that sort of thing, a very, not clinical exactly, but, you know, a, a comforting clinical. So safety floor and yeah, but in with, you know, wooden uh, effects, that sort of thing. So, you know, all of those things are still there. Um, the TV is still there, so we can have things on the TV and stuff. So, you know, it, there's a lot of familiarity that's going to be there. It's just adding those little extra precautions and stickers on the floor for social distancing and little things, I think. And I think that the, the important thing is just to recognize where, where the risks are, develop your practice to, to fit those, that risk assessment, to maintain your, your friendly approach, but, and, and warn patients as well. And I think, one thing we have done is we've been sending out a couple of emails and um, something which I want to do is something which I've seen uh, Gareth from the IPO group. Uh, they sent out, he sent out um, a video to all the patients where we showed a walkthrough of the new normal for, for the patients um, accessing the practice, how they fill in the, the forms digitally before they come in, um, how they come in and they'll still greet people exactly the same at the desk, but there's the guard there. Um, he's there and he's saying it's still the same friendly team, you know, and I think that's important. So people aren't then afraid of coming in. They realize that it's a safe environment and, and realistically, you know, regardless of the, maybe a couple of setbacks uh, from a couple of things, the, the dental surgery is still a very safe environment that, you know, we've been, we've been dealing with all sorts of, you know, diseases, risks 
from you know HIV to yeah. for decades that we know how to risk assess and we know how to control infection so if we can provide that in a competent atmosphere one but also pre-warn the patient of how that experience is the difficulty i see is going to be for the people who you know really expect things to just go back to normal and come into the practice uh without you know ringing ahead that sort of thing so the, the what we're trying to do at the minute is plan ahead for those scenarios so that the I'm always a great believer that if you can really plan ahead, then you can mm. figure things out before you get to need them. So we haven't had it yet, but I'm, I'm very aware that we're most likely going to have people coming in, not on their own, not um, keeping a social distance, sitting next to people, you know, knocking on the front door and banging away until someone comes to the door, all that sort of stuff. So it's what you do in those scenarios. And if you plan for it, then you're, you're aware of it. Your team's trained to deal with it. And then you can you can go forward and, and prepare for the best and the worst. Okay. Um, so now we're about to get the part where people who've been listening can actually ask Professor Nulty any questions. Um, and I think just before we go we go to that, um, I think people can either message, um, send a message, then I can ask any questions that they may have. And just I think finally um, in this section, is there anything? Is there any advice that you would sort of give to dentists who might be slightly concerned about opening up or is there anything that you've learned just from your experience of having people in practice over the last week that you can share with us? Um, yeah, I would. I would, I would definitely like to say to the whole profession, just keep positive. There's some really great people who've been trying to keep you positive on social media, like Kapoor, Shalin and, people like that, that um, are really, really lovely to see things. And, and I would say as well, two things. One, um, don't let it get you down. We will get through it. Keep positive. Mm. Uh, two, don't focus on just dentistry and the, the downside of things. Speak to all, you, um, all the people around you. You know, Talk about things. Talk to your staff about non-COVID-19 things to get back at that a little bit to normal. Uh, and number three, something which you know put on social media that's taken off well, uh, especially if you're private, but there's you know always room for people to do similar for NHS. Is really trying to um, keep together because I think whether it be you know the COVID nineteen the PPE thing that people were doing, whether it be people talking on social media and forming new groups, whether it be private dentists banned under the IPO or whoever, the you know all of those things. Um, it'd be really nice to see dentistry move out of you know, the very secluded work on my practice side of things. And we, what we're trying to do at the minute is have local groups. So we've set up a group for people in the Manchester area. There's people setting up for like Cambridge and Essex and London, that sort of thing. So that you know all of the dentists around you. Talk to each other. Keep in touch with people that you've never met and, and you know, work out things. Tell them if you need something. And it works really nicely for things like... Um, you know, with on the group, even just on the last day, people have been talking about where to do a fit testing course online in that area or, you know, all those sorts of things so that you can really stay abreast of issues, but also yeah. plan to be able to, you know, deal with things quickly. And in the future, when things go back to normal, you know, it can still be there that those groups and that local collaboration to be able to work best in the, for the best interest of patients, refer to each other, ask, you know, help on things, um, low on stock, maybe you could borrow something, all of those sorts of things, you know, so keeping friendly and, and really, I'd, I'd really like everybody in dentistry to stay positive and let's, let's get rid of the bad things from the past, you know, the old boys clubs, the, the negative trolling, all that sort of stuff. Let's throw that out the window. Let's start to work towards a future where dentistry can really come to its own and be professional and, and be respected without all of the negative side effects that come along with social media and things like that. So you're advocating collaborating sort of locally and nationally to support everybody who's working in, in dentistry. We've okay. done it with PPE so we can do it with each other, 100%. Yeah, I mean, that does make absolute perfect sense. Um, and I think it's probably one of the positives that's come out of this is that people have started working together, talking more and actually trying to do something, whether that is the PPE or whether it is just supporting each other and having a conversation with each other if things are not going as well as they perhaps could be. 
Yeah, and, and I would say as well to add to that with working in a collaborated front, um, it's not just about the dental team, the dentists, keep mm -hmm. in mind the, te the technicians, the, the therapists, the nurses, all those different parts of the team. We don't want them to come back to work and think what's happening, you know, what, yeah. what do I do? It's educating all those team members. And, you know, if we do get new technologies to help out with that, great, but make sure they know how to use it. So little things that, um, things, I mean, I'm probably going off on a tangent, but it's digital, so I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> something which we started to put in place the last six months was um, um, having the TCO in the practice that has one of the rooms that was empty. Uh, one What's or two, a TCO? Uh, so a treatment coordinator. So oh, right, okay. One of the nurses trained up as a treatment coordinator, and then they can then scan patients, that sort of thing. We'll have to work out the kinks with everything with COVID risk, PPE, that sort of thing, but mm. involve them in the team so that they themselves can guide a little part of everything and give everybody a role that they're aware of, you know, the same as we do every, every day with policies and all that, and, you know, keeping on top of, you know, things that we have in the decon room and what have you. So, you know, everybody's got a role, and, and I think the team would like that. So, you know, everybody understands what part they play in making a success of things going forward again. Okay. Um, I think you've been so um, succinct and um, entertaining that nobody's actually asked us any questions. <laughs> so I think last chance for anybody who's actually on the call, if they want to message a question. Um, uh, anything. Sorry? And if I have for breakfast, I've not had lunch yet. <laughs> <laughs> did you miss lunch you said that you 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 got you uh yeah you got caught up in editing something before you yeah, came yeah yeah um i've still got things with the the phd stuff but um, i've been writing a couple of uh, literature reviews and stuff hopefully to help out with the ppe going forward i'm sorry i'm sorry that we interrupted that no, but me, i lost track of time <laughs> thank you very much for joining us today i think that's all we've got time for um, and I'm sure there's going to be another chance to speak to um, Professor Nolte. So um, like and subscribe to pages and channels and look out for other videos that we're doing. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for everybody who's um, joined us today. And um, we'll see you all soon. If anybody has any questions, they're more than welcome to get in touch as well. Thank you very much, Adam. Pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.